Good morning. This is Dr. Bob O. Coming to you with another book talk uh, today. Wow, this is a pretty heavy book. Uh, Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump. Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump. It was just published May 2020 uh, in effort for 30 evangelical Christian leaders on issue on justice, truth, and moral integrity. Edited by none other than Ronald Sider. I think we really need prayer before I do this. <laughs> Holy Spirit, God, come. Oh, Lord, uh, we need you desperately for America today. It is so divided. Uh, the devil, the foul spirit, has divided Christians uh, to both extremes, Lord. God, give us wisdom. Help us, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a one loaded book, and I like to, I would like to start with Ronald Sider's prayer that he posted in the last page and the last paragraph. He writes, We pray for ourselves and Every Christian in this nation, please, Lord, show us how to pray and listen to each other so that you can use us to guide our nation to a better future. Even more important, please, Lord, help us Christians to act in our political engagement in such a way that non-Christians are attracted to our Lord. Wow! He summed it up. I guess that's why he's a chief editor of all this collection of curator of evangelical perspective. Of course, it is one, one-sided perspective because everybody basically writes under the title The Spiritual Danger of Donald Trump. Of course, they are not Trumpers. Um, and this prayer kind of wraps it up. In this, our political engagement, the enemy uh, convinced us that the right wing are the enemy, or left wing are the enemy, or the conservative are enemy, the fundamentals are the enemy, and that if you don't vote for Trump, you're not a Christian. Kind of sentiment conjured up by idiots. I mean, uh, some well-meaning, stupid, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, every time you say something like that, if you're a Christian, you have to vote for Trump. Um, you really show your stupidity. That's not how uh, rational mind with common sense should work. We're a thinking being. We're an emotional being. We're uh, creating God's image. And, and God calls um, Christians in different areas and different pockets of influence so that we could be salt and light. And putting the whole uh, election and whole democratic system as one value, like, oh, if you're a Christian, are you going to vote against a candidate who does not support uh, abortion? I support uh, a person who, I mean, he would have 10,000 views on 10,000 issues, and maybe I disagree with a couple thousand issues, but I will support him because the agreement and of my own faith. And we need to create a room for the other person to have their opinion in democratic society. So when Ronald Sider writes that, I mean, I said amen to that. I bought this book because I was so frustrated, fr very frustrated. And Randall Balmer writes it this way. Randall Balmer, his credential, I'll read his credential so that you know that he's just not some guy off the street saying rambling stuff. Red, Randall Balmer is a PhD, holds the John Phillips Chair of Religion at Dartmouth, the oldest endowed professorship at Dartmouth College. He earned his PhD from Princeton 
And he wrote books like Redeemer, The Life of Jimmy Carter, God in the White House, How Fate Shaped Presidency of John F. Kennedy to George Bush, Making of Evangelicalism from Revivalism to Politics and Beyond. So Professor Randall Balmer writes, the first paragraph is article. After a long and lingering illness, evangelicalism died on November 8, 2016. On that day, 81% of white American evangelicals who for decades claimed to be concerned about family values registered their vote for a twice-divorced, thrice-married, self-confessed sexual predator whose understanding of faith is so truncated that he can't even fake religious literacy. <laughs> Takes a smart guy to write something like that. And he argues that, well, how, what is evangelicalism? Who are the evangelicals? Well, first, he says, well, people who believe in Trinitarian God, tr Trinity. Second, people focus on being born again. Third, people who believe in evangelism. So this three-part definition, Bible as God's revelation to human, humanity, the centrality of conversion, and the responsibility to evangelize is kind of broad one, intentionally, to say that these are the evangelicals in America. And then he, I love the way he simplified the North American. Historically, evangelicalism, evangelicalism emerged in North America in the middle decades of the 18th century from the confluence of three Ps, the vestige of New England Puritanism, continental pietism, and middle colonies and Scottish, Scot, Scots-Irish Presbyterianism. Three Ps. I know, for some people who really scholarly, say, oh, I disagree. Okay, you could disagree. But I'm simply saying that that's how he defines American evangelicalism that has died in 2016. And, and interestingly, because I always follow Charles Finley, he considered Charles Finley as a symbolic leader of this evangelicalism and also uh, <laughs> Jimmy Carter. Wow. So what happened? So what happened? How did it die? God, this is I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm challenging you to read this book yourself you know because I, 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 I cannot really justify explaining the whole book on maybe 30 minutes 40 minute talk but nevertheless um, he puts Randall Balmer puts Donald Trump and the death of evangelicalism beautifully and explained and and that's kind of the death of evangelicals in America is what I felt 2016. I was at Oxford. I heard the result of Trump being, becoming the president and also the fact that 81% uh, of so-called evangelical Christians have voted Trump when evangelicals represent about one-third of Christians in America. Something died. Something in me like, my Lord, what has happened? This comes out of Cascade Books, Whip and Stock. It's a publishing house called Whip and Stock. That's the publishing house that I publish my book, Prayer Driven Life. And so they really wanted to publish right away, May 13, 2020. It came out in effort to challenge evangelicals who voted for Trump 2016 to wake up and what are you doing you know do not cast your vote on this crazy maniac that's that was the intention and so they start the book by quoting Isaiah 118 come now and let us reason together says the Lord <laughs> reason together you know well it's unbelievable that I heard that Still, more than 70% of evangelicals voted for Trump. So in, in that way, this book failed. But I think this book will become prophetic as time passes on. Because it will explain how Trump 
has deceived the minds of evangelicals. And I'm trying to write a book called Trump Cult, The Deceiving of the Evangelical Minds in America. That's the title of my book. I'm working on it. I don't know. It's, it's just writing it uh, and getting some information on it just depresses me. I don't want to even want to mention Trump anymore because it just brings me down. Um, Ronald Sider, in introduction, writes, The growing evidence shows that more and more Americans are rejecting Christian faith. That is especially true of young people, including youth who grew up in evangelical churches, and many attribute their turning away from Christianity to what they consider immoral, fundamentally wrong, politically engaged by Christians, especially evangelical Christians. So when Ron Sider prays that, Lord, that non-Christian will be attracted to our Lord, that even young churchgoers are turned up by the parents' spirituality that supports Trump. That's what he's saying. We published this book, he writes, with deep sadness and persistent hope. Sadness, indeed grief, and that current politics is so divisive and dysfunctional and hope that biblical values and constitutional standards will prevail. We write frankly about current politics and presidential leadership. Hmm. But we do not do that as people committed to one political party. Good. We are Republicans, good, Democrats, and independent. We do not all agree on how faithful Christians should vote on November 3rd, 2020. <laughs> well, how did we vote? And it talks about how um, we really have been deceived and how core values of Christian value has been violated by one person in all accounts and yet he's the one that we want to be represented to non-Christians. So Irene Fowler writes in her column, Core Christian Values and Presidency. The Bible seems to be talking about people like Trump when he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having form of godliness but deny its power, having nothing to do with such people. 2 Corinthians 3, 2-5. And she writes, isn't that a biblical description of our current president? Shouldn't we be deeply concerned that Bible warns us not to have anything to do with such someone like this? Wow. If this, this passage is the description of Trump, does that not raise question about whether Christians should support him? If Trump portrays himself as a Christian and says he holds Christian value, shouldn't Christian be the first to demand his action are kept with his biblical values? I said amen to that. And of course, you know, um, not only Christian values, but my goodness, the stuff that he say and the action that he has portrayed uh, over and over again. contradicts. Um, now, reading this book, I was quite saddened because um, it was written by 99%, I mean, almost 100% by um, Caucasian, mostly male. And But there was one, uh, just a little section by David S. Lin from Manila, Philippines. 
he is the man that I actually met several times at an international conference, the missiolo missiological conferences um, in uh, Lausanne, uh, in, um, in Chiang Mai, in other countries. And so I met him several times. We have a discussion. And so he's a, a professor and PhD, uh, and his name is David S. Lin. He writes, and so he's the only representation of Asian representation talking about Trump. I, I really, I really wish that they would have contacted me. I would have had my view printed in this prophetic book. So, you know, 50 years from now, 20 years from now, people will say, how do we get deceived, you know, by Trump? He writes, why not re-elect Trump? Eight reasons. I share my political view as a representative voice of evangelical movement in Asia, having been in the leadership terms of Lausanne movement in Philippines since 2007 and in Asia, especially Southeast Asia since 2008. Wow. As a vocal critic of the Trump-like Philippine president, Rodrigo Durarte, I would like to call evangelical citizens of USA to campaign as vehemently as possible to oppose the re-election re of President Donald Trump. <laughs> Here in brief, the eight main reasons why I urge Americans, especially evangelicals, not to vote for Trump again. Number one, person, personal integrity matters. No one in right mind will say, well, yeah, well, Trump he has personal integrity. I respect him. I want my son to be just like him in, in terms of personal integrity. No one will say that. And he has his explanation. Number two, leadership style matters. Trump has practiced a Machiavellian or dictator style of leadership as shown in high regard. And so well, no one will argue with that as well because his leadership marks is very similar to Hitler. Third, national unity matters. Populism claimed to represent the common people and use narrow national sentiment like building walls and discriminating against minorities, gain loyalties and votes, and no one will deny that. And then justice, justice, pol just policies matters. Foreign policy matters. Climate crisis matters. Evangelical brand matters. And I think this is, this is what we need to. U.S. leadership matters. So from uh, people from outside of U.S. are saying, what are you guys doing? You were at one point leaders. The evangelicals were leading the world and then the Christians all over the world could simply point to, well, look what Christians are doing in America. That's what we're trying to mimic. No longer. They're saying that, oh my gosh, we cannot. Matter of fact, when we do that, they said, is that what you want to do? America first? No Muslim in this country? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to be just like Muslims? Killing non-Muslims? Unbelievable. And then he writes, evangelical brand matters. I have started label ourselves post-evangelical and white evangelical as fundamentalist. Wow. We long to return to being called simply evangelicals with white American fundamentalists on board too, as soon as possible. <laughs> In short, you need to redeem the damage of bringing embarrassment, if not dishonor, to your country's status and to Christ's name in Trump's first term. Can you say anything more stronger than that? And that sentiment, if you never left America, even I'm talking to even some of the pastors who never traveled out of America and think that America is the center of the universe and you think that everybody loves Americans and because we're Americans. You know what people think when Trump says America first in a nation that consumes 60% of the world's wealth? If there's only 10 bread in the world, six breads are consumed by Americans. And four are divided up by the rest of the country. Don't blame China. Right? And then for a nation that consumes six breads, there's available 10 breads in the world, says the America first. And they, and, and they refuse to bur burden themselves with refugee crisis. Wow. In short, you need to redeem the damage of bringing embarrassment, if not dishonor, to your country's status and to Christ's name to try for Trump's first term. And yet, 
seventy percent of evangelical Christians said, "Make great America." That, yeah, that is some, that's the something that you never, never be able to understand unless you really been out there talking with the world, talking, meeting with, and and then. And something happened with Christianity today. I just did a talk, book talk on Christianity today, and how they do not represent Asians in their magazines. But listen, uh, the chief editor who now resigned, Mark Gali, writes, On this one reason, I argue in my December 19, 2019 Christianity Today editorial that Trump is morally unfit for office. I certainly am in no position to judge his relationship with God, though I admit that some of his, my language seemed to suggest that who on us does not have a great deal of confessed to God, it seems to personal failings. To be sure, we're getting peeked into blah, 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 and then basically he's writing that 1998 Southern Baptist Resolution completely trash-talked Bill Clinton's moral failure. And yet, when it comes to Trump, they completely changed their views to support. And then he writes uh, the words of the, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn about America in his 1983 Templeton Price address applies specifically to Christians in America today. We have forgotten God. We have forgotten God. Wow. Well, Chris Thurman writes in his chapter 2, God hates a lying tongue, a PhD author, the lies we believe in. So his PhD was on lying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's an expert in lying and liars. He wrote his PhD on that, wrote a book on that. And so he writes very simply. While every president lies, not every president is a pathological liar. Donald Trump is a pathological liar. In his expertise, as the PhD in ly lying and liars, he says, Donald Trump is a pathological liar. When those who know Trump says he, not just the public, but when those who know Trump well says he's a pathological liar, we need to take it seriously with great alarm. Wow. Yeah, we should, right? After three years in office, Trump had made over 16,000 false or misleading statements. 16,000. Right? Uh, and then, as an expert of lying, he writes the following. Why does Trump lie? If you examine his lies, so he did an analytical study as a research. It seems that two primary things are motivating Trump. First, he lied to prep prop himself up to make himself look better in other people's eyes than he is in reality. Okay? And you hear that over and over and over and over and over and over again. Every time you turn on, he does that. Second, Trump lies to mean to sadist sadistically tear other people down and make them feel small. Okay, there are many reasons Trump lies, but his narcissistic desire to make himself look good and sadistic desire to demean others are the two most powerful motivations behind tenuous relationship with the truth. Wow. Yeah. Does it really matter when president chronically lies? There are six things that Lord hates, seven that detestable to him. Naughty eyes, lying tongue, Proverbs 6.16. And he writes, if for Christian we continue to enable a pathological liar to remain present, we are going to see greater damage inflicted on the cause of Christ and our God-given authority as Christians to speak out against immor immorality and injustice. Nat Natsworth writes, race baiter, mis misogynist, and a fool. Wow. Trump's promise to evangelicals were similar to Satan's offering to Jesus. While tempting Jesus in the desert, the Bible tells us, devil took him to very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all this I'll give to you.
and continues to write, the main problem with evangelical supports for Trump isn't what happened on election day. It's the defense of Trump. Design, and, and, and this is so appropriate. Trump's evangelical supporters should confront these three disturbing facts. Number one, only white evangelical voted for Trump in high numbers. Two, racists like the ultra-right movement supported Trump and have been energized by his presidency. Number three, Trump mobilized racist sentiment in his campaign. And he's arguing, how are you okay with that? How are you okay with that? Trump purposely used the tribalism of white people and the fear of non-white people to mobilize voters. And you know that. And how are you okay with that? And then he will publicly say things like, well, he, no, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read because I don't want to shock you. Grab him by the pussy. After the tape was released, 10 women came forward and accused Trump of doing what he bragged about doing, groping, kissing them without their consent. Another said he offered her 10000 to have sex with him. Since then, the, the list has grown to at least 23 accusers coming out public. Grab them by the pussies. I know some people, oh God, Pastor, how can you say such vulgar thing in your YouTube channel? How can you have someone like that in the presidency who publicly said that? And 23 women are saying that, well, that's what he did. He writes... In 1992, New York Magazine interview, woman, you should, you should, you man, you should treat them like shit. That's what he said. 1992, New York Times Magazine, woman, you should treat them like shit. Is he a misog mis misogynist? <laughs> yeah, it's the definition of that. And he, so he, con he concludes, I honestly don't know what makes me more sick. Listening to Trump brag about groping women or listening to my fellow evangelicals defending him. And he, he quotes, Sorry losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest, and you all know it. Please don't feel so stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. Two things that we know about Trump is that he boasts about himself often and he doesn't seek counsel of others. Trump is a very biblical definition of a fool. Trump does not read. <laughs> he concludes. Well, I think I better stop because I'm, I'm not really edifying myself. And maybe... Um, Yeah, I, I feel kind of I filthy, gross talking about him right now. So I, I should stop. Let me just pray. Holy Spirit, God, I'm so sorry. I, I'm emotionally so upset. And maybe we really need to pray that Christians will come to terms with not only electing, and after seeing what he did for four years, still defending him, 70% of evangelical Christians, Lord. Help us, Father, to see the light that we may really put this behind, that the secular people, the young people in church, will see us and be attracted to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. See you on next book talk.